All right, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Matty Osmandion. This work was done at my internship at Microsoft Research in collaboration with uh, Mark Hancock from University of Waterloo. One of my favorite quotes is from a movie called The Prestige. It tells the story of two rivaling illusionists. One of them is reckless. He's absolutely obsessed and he sacrifices everything. He stops at nothing to make the best illusions possible. On his deathbed, his arch enemy asks him, why? Tell me why you spent so much obsessing over these illusions. And he said, you never really understood it, did you? He said, the audience knows the truth. The world is simple. But if you could fool them, even for a second, then you can make them wonder. Then you can get to see something really special. And it was all the look on their faces. Today I want to talk about my obsession with illusions and virtual reality. I'm going to start with a very simple trick. You're going to come into a room, you're going to see three cubes on a table. You're going to put on a head mount display, a virtual reality head mount display, and then you're going to see three virtual cubes. Everything seems nice and dandy. Then, without you knowing, I'm going to reach out and remove two of those cubes, leaving only one behind. Then the experience starts, you're like, okay, reach out and grab the blue cube, and you reach out and grab the blue cube, then reach out and grab the green one. Then you keep doing this again and again. And you're thinking, this is the most stupid demo I've ever experienced. But you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. The, same, the whole time you're reaching out and grabbing the same cube. And you had no idea until you take off the HMD. And you, people's expressions are absolutely priceless. Now, I'm going to go against the illusionist's code and reveal our secret in this talk today. This is something we, called haptic, we call haptic retargeting. It's essentially... This slide. It's, Haptic retargeting allows physical props to be reused um, for haptics by leveraging the dominance of vision to retarget people's hand motions. Essentially what this means in practice is a single prop can be repurposed to allow movement and stacking of a virtual space with a multitude of virtual objects. But why do we care about these illusions? We don't want, just want to, we're not in the business of tricking people only. Let's, let's take a step back and think about virtual and augmented reality experiences. Normally the first thing happens, especially in VR, is that you put on HMD and your body's gone. You completely lose connection with your body and you, you can't interact with the world. Or with augmented reality, you see your body, but you can't really interact with the world and affect the world the way you naturally would. Or sometimes you have a controller and you can't really interact with the fidelity that you normally have in an experience. So as Dan talked about, we, we care a lot about haptics and people have looked at different ways of bringing in haptics, like the Phantom or the CyberGrasp glove. But one other way of doing this is using passive haptics. Essentially, there's a one-to-one -one mapping with everything in the virtual world and the real world, and you can reach out and grab objects, and um, it's a very, uh, very compelling experience when you can interact with things in the most natural way that we're used to. So that works, and it's all good, but what if you have a lot of virtual objects that uh, are not really present in the scene? It's a sort of similar to the notion of the next in reality. But, um, what do you do here? If you want to have, let's say you want to make a Minecraft castle, okay? And there's all these, uh, what you would need, if you want to make a castle, you're going to have to have a castle of cubes around and move those around. This is not really practical to do with of Haptics. So we asked ourselves, how can you make a single object provide haptics again and again and sort of repurpose the haptics that you're getting from the object? And the solution that we found for this is to hack the human perception, all right? So these kind of illusions have been around for quite a while. Our inspiration essentially was redirected touching where the high level idea is to warp the virtual space to map differently shaped virtual objects onto a, serial, onto a single real object. And their classic example you see, you come up to a, a square shaped panel facing you, but in the virtual world you see a, the same panel but it's rotated away from you. And you reach out and interact with it and somehow the haptic from the, the uh, the physical object is providing, ha it's lining up with the virtual object. Or another example, you see yourself interacting with this curved surface and you're seeing your hand moving up and down. You're convinced that this uh, s virtual surface is, uh, is curved, but in reality you're actually touching a flat surface and you're convinced because of what you see, overriding what your body is telling you. Another space that also uses these kind of illusions is redirected walking. The problem here that they care about is being able to explore large virtual environments when you have a small track space. 
the kind of thing that they do is they manipulate your tra your the trajectory that you have in the real world. So you end up walking in a certain path in the virtual reality experience, and you're perceiving that, but you're in reality, you're walking on a different path. So in the, in an example that they had was that you can be walking on a zigzag path shown in blue here and perceiving that in the virtual environment, but in reality, you're just walking back and forth on, say, on the same path. Now, uh, the key idea that they use here is something called rotation gain. It's the idea of upscaling your, your rotations in the virtual and real uh, environment. So essentially, in this example here, you can be rotating in, in place 180 degrees, but in, in the virtual environment, you'll be seeing yourself rotating only 90 degrees. And as a result, as a result you're going to be walking on a path. Overall, you're going to be having a trajectory in the real world that's different from what you have in the virtual world. So you can do a lot of things with... Um, Changing per people's perception of the shape of objects with redirected touching or get people to think differently about the space that they're walking in with a real walking. But we ask ourselves, what can you do with objects and props and grab them and move them around? Before we start to talk about this, let's talk about the hardware configuration that we use for our system. So one key thing that we really cared about was to somehow get our body back into the experience and reproject body back in, into the workspace. To do this, we mounted a connect uh, from the ceiling, looking downward, essentially looking at the real environment to understand what's going on to be able to render that in the virtual scene. And we also had users um, put on a head-mount display, an Oculus, and interact with props in the virtual environment. We also needed to uh, ha track a few things. We needed to track our hand, a cube, and a wand. And this is, uh, of course, this the way we track things is a very simplistic, expedient method for our study, but in, in reality, you would probably use something more viable and usable in for a demonstration. We also had a little simple knob, the con confirm button, to progress the experience further. And when you put that all together, you get this uh, video that we saw, um, this experience here that you can naturally interact. You see your own hand, uh, the way it is, the shape that it actually has. You can reach out and grab objects, and you can touch them, you can feel them. The mapping is very, very compelling. <clears throat> so let's talk about our first, first trick. Our first trick is called body warping. What this means is that we take this virtual representation of your body and we manipulate it. Like for, for, as an example here, if you have a physical cube and a virtual cube on the side, what we can do is as a user is reaching their hand towards the cube, you can have their hand shift virtually to the side and align with the virtual cube that they're trying to reach. And this was a, this was a key idea behind the first trick that we showed you where as a user is reaching out to grab the objects, their hand is, let's say for the blue cube, their hand is gradually shifting to the right and lining up with the blue cube. Or for the left, for the red one, they're gradually shifting to the left to line up with the red cube. Another trick that we have is called world warping. World warping is similar to redirected walking. It's using the idea of rotation and scaling up motions. So for instance, in this case, we can have a user do a say 90 degree rotation with their head, but virtually the world is also rotating around them without them noticing. And you can have virtual objects line up with your physical by using this technique. To demonstrate this, we had a ring of cubes demonstration that we made where you can have a physical cube line up with a bunch of cubes on a ring by rotating the world around them. So the user would look to the right, look at a billboard, and then look back and another uh, cube was available to reach out and grab. And essentially the reason we're having people rotate their heads is to use these head motions to subtly rotate the world around them and then get the cubes to line up on a different one, one at a time. Now, we use hand motions to uh, create body warping, and then we, we leverage head motions to have world warping. Then we said, how can we combine these two for a hybrid mechanism? So the way it would work would be that, let's say, um, when you want to do the line, alignment, you split the alignment task between world and body. So with your head motions, part of the alignment is done with the world warping. Then when you reach out to grab the object, the rest of it is taken care of by body warping. And that's the, the essential, so potentially, potentially you can increase the power of your alignments and things you can do when you have a hybrid mechanism. But the coolest thing that we can do with, with uh, this kind of manipulation is stacking. We wanted to get a sense of grabbing an object and stacking it on another object that doesn't even exist there. And the way we did this was that we applied the same idea of warping but to the height. So like when you're moving your object, when you reach up and grab it to put it on a target location, your um, a height warp is applied, so you put the cube on the table again, but somehow you see your hand going up, you're convinced that, oh, this stacked. I remember a person was doing this in, a, in the, our experiment, and he was like, 
well, should I just let it go? I said, yeah, have faith, brother. And he let go. He was like, whoa, it stayed. And he expected it to drop down, but it was stayed right there. <clears throat> now, to put this all to the test, we conducted a study. Um, the task involved our motivating ex- example of doing a mine, uh, being able to create a Minecraft castle. The experience worked like this. Essentially, we guided the users in the process of creating a Minecraft castle. It started with them looking at a billboard to the side to get the new instruction. They'd look back and see a blue cube that would spawn, and then they would put it in the red target location. Then they'd press a button, and the cube would solidify. Then they'd look back again to the billboard, and when they look, and they would look back at the table, they'd see a new cube magically spawning, and then out of thin air, and then grab, they'd grab that and put it in the target location. And, and they'd do this nine times to be able to create a shape that we were giving them. The conditions we had were for uh, each participant experienced different conditions, the same conditions. Um, we had different manipulation techniques, the ones we mentioned. We had only body, only world, only hybrid warping, and we also had a baseline where we used a virtual wand, which is essentially a case where you would not have haptics in VR, and you would grab a wand, reach out, and click to grab a virtual object, move it around, and click again to release it. And that's how that was the baseline for making this castle. We had 20 participants. It first started with them. We did an ocular dominance test and some spatial visualization tests before the study. And beginning at each condition, they could play around with the cube a little bit to get comfortable and acclimated to it for a minute before we started the actual task. And the task involved looking at the billboard, getting the instruction, putting the blue cube at the red target location nine times to the end. And as at the end of the condition, we would have them fill in an immersive tendencies questionnaire to measure presence. And we also track their hand locations to analyze the way their hands were moving. The results from our presence, oh, the, the details are in the paper. What the, the most important thing is that our hybrid technique was significantly better than the wand method. And people claim that the presence that they, that they have felt from the hybrid technique was way more than one. But interestingly, some people did prefer, like at least one person did mention that uh, this is all nice, but I prefer ha- using a wand because of the simplicity and unencumbering nature of a wand. It's interesting how technology changes the way what what we call natural and what we're used to. The more details on the breakdown of presence are in the paper. So we also looked at their hand motions. We wanted to see how their hands were moving. So we plotted the trajectory of their hands when they'd reach out to grab a cube, and we plotted them for different conditions. We noticed about 30% of the time with body warping, the body warping condition, what would happen would be they'd reach out and somehow miss, and they'd have, they'd see, we'd see a kink in their trajectory, and they'd have to reach back and adjust and grab the cue. And so, but this did not happen for the world warping situa- situation. And what was going on was that, so they see a virtual cube, say the visual target is um, onto the right, and on the left, the physical cube is actually located on the left. So if you split the virtual and visual uh, representations, what's going on is that they would do this, they'd see the virtual visual target, they'd do this quick ballistic motion to reach and grab it, and then they'd see their hand miss because of the shift that was applied, and they'd come back and readjust and grab the, uh, grab the virtual cube. And, but if they move their hands slowly, then they would gradually see things shifting, and then they'd trust their vision over their body and li- grab the object and, li- and grab it properly. <clears throat> so what do we learn from this? Essentially, body warping provides definitely guarantees alignment because the user is definitely going to need to reach out and grab the object. So there's hand motions that always you can rely on to be able to do body warping. On the other hand, you would have to do it slowly because if you reach out, you can miss, and that can affect people's um, performance. World warping, on the other hand, it, re- it requires you to do head movements, which movements which you can't necessarily rely on always being present. But if you do manage to get it, things will line up perfectly before you, the user's reaching, and you'd have no missed targets. The hybrid warping is sort of a happy medium that's trying to bring the best of both worlds and mitigate the artifacts you have, which each of these techniques use separately. In the future, what we want to do is investigate detection thresholds to see, uh, for each of these techniques, how much can you get away with without them noticing? Or to what point can you push them without them, um, without affecting and ruining their performance? And this ex- the demo that we showed you here, this uh, study that we had, the user was being guided. To, we knew which cube they're going to grab. We knew which, where it was going to go. But we also had a few demonstrations that we played around with trying to predict what the user is going to do based on their hand motions and their speed and try to uh, pr- have a predictive method instead of just uh, forcing the user to, to um, carry out a task like a robot. And we also want to look into being able to map different types of object, objects to each other, in, other instead of 
uh, only mapping things that virtually and physically have the same shape. We also want to look into advanced ways of warping the world because we have access to the, to the mesh rendering of the user, and we can potentially manipulate things and shift things around without them knowing. So in summary, again, haptic retargeting allows physical props to be reused for haptics. And the key idea behind this is we trust our eyes over what our body is telling us. And using this, we can have a single prop and repurpose it to allow movement and stacking uh, in a virtual environment. And if you hadn't had a chance to check out our interactivity demo, definitely try it out. And I assure you, the stacking is really magical. Thank you. Hi, Roll Vertigal, Queen's University. Very nice work. Um, have you tried this while uh, being ambulant, i.e. walking, and what happens? Because you're kind of screwing around with the exproprioception, so I would argue that it gets a lot harder. When you're walking around? Yeah, I mean, Am I, I understand that this is hard to do with a, with a physical object, but you can imagine taking this task into a more mobile space rather than being seated behind the table. Well, actually, in, in the redirective walk, touching work that was done, they also looked at what if you can walk around and redirect people and come back in and the and grab the same object? Yeah. If that makes sense? Yeah. So they line yeah, up exactly. things yeah. again and again. Yeah, so they have done, actually done that. But that required you to walk up. We were actually sorry, focusing on the case where you're having a seated VR experience, which yeah. is probably what we're going to be seeing for the, the near-term future. So they have looked at doing a little bit of that, um, but they didn't do the exact same type of warping that we're doing. It's actually our next step that we want to put it into a vibe and have you stand around and walk around and interact yeah. with objects. But yeah, we haven't exactly, I mean, if you're standing, I don't think it should be a problem, but walking around, when you start walking, we can use you, redirected walking techniques. When you start techniques. shifting the world, then you might not end up at the same spot, for example. Yeah, well, that's, that's exactly what redirected walking does, and there's nothing wrong with it necessarily. Right. As long as you don't have people walk into targets that they don't see. Right. Right. Okay. Thanks. Absolutely. Hello. Nice oh. talk. Thank I you. really enjoyed it. Uh, and even I tried the demo, it was awesome. Uh, my question is, so essentially while trying, uh, while doing the hand warping or world, wipe, uh, world warping, mm -hmm. you need uh, kind of a delimiter action, right? So is it possible to have a continuous engagement and still do, still try to do the same thing? What do you mean delimiter exactly? As in uh, disengagement. Right, engage, right. And, and disengagement has to be there yes. for you to do magic. Correct. Right. So the thing is, that, uh, the way I imagine things uh, being done in the future, or let's say you really want to make a Minecraft castle on your own, I think you would have, say, two, three, four physical cubes on the table, and you reach out and grab this here, and then for the next one you want to grab, you grab another cube, and then that al allows disengagement and engagement again. So being able to create a castle on your own with a single cube, I doubt that will be really possible, but if you have three or four cubes, and if you can make a, a, a castle of 100 cubes out of that, I think that would be pretty awesome. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll take a final one. Hey. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was just wondering, can you give some intuition how far you could go with radial movement instead of tangential movement? If radial movement. If so you move the, you know. It's, uh, yeah. We actually did a perceptual study before all of this to have a sense of how much we can get away with. Um, the most sensitive people, you can laterally move them like a good eight centimeters, ten centimeters without noticing. But some people, I mean, I'm talking about the average or like more the more um, proficient users. Uh, angularly speaking, again, surprisingly, I was like around eight to ten degrees is also how much you can do for proficient. Uh, somehow, eight and ten is the magical number. But I've I've gone away with twenty. People didn't bother at all, and um, yeah. But yeah, I haven't gone beyond twenty degrees, and so people definitely start noticing once it's, it's beyond twenty degrees. And uh, something that I didn't mention was that. Um, one thing you have to be careful about is how you're applying these manipulations and how it's affecting other things. Like um, when we were rotate, we were applying certain shifts, we made sure that the user wouldn't see their hand like detach and go away from them. So like instead we would rotate around their body so they would at least see the continuity here. So there's other things that starts become, start become a problem once you want to do a lot of manipulations. Even if they don't notice, they're going to be like, okay, why is my hand coming out of my throat? You know what I mean? Or out of my mouth? You know what I mean? Like, so we have to be careful about the kind of things you can do with that. Thanks. All right.